know with your voice. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. singing in faith, lift your voice. Oh, may I then in Him be found, trust in His righteousness alone, for this stand before the throne.
closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be Come on, you lift your voice There is another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need a reminder Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire All my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world
know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be, Lord I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that you're with me I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be your voice if you know it. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Come on, you sing. Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause you're all I want, Jesus. Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? As I walk.
sing it, I'm not enough. Lift your hands and lift your voice. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Come on, one more time. I'm not enough. You sing it. I'm not enough. Unless you come, will you meet me here again, Lord? Cause you're all I want, Lord. Cause all I want is all you are. It's all you are. Will you meet me here again? Will you meet me here again? So God, we come to you with expectation that you will be with us, that you abide, you abide with us, God, and among us, you walk among us, that you inhabit the praises of your people, you enthrone, you, you seat yourself on the praises of your people, God. We love you. We can do nothing without you. We need you, Lord. We are desperate for your presence. So God, we thank you that you promise that you will be with us where two or three are gathered in your name, that you are there with them. God, we thank you that you are here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, clap your hands for that worship time, and then you guys can be seated. You know, when we come into a relationship with God, um, I believe that God meets some of the deepest desires of our heart. And I believe that each one of us, and I believe every single person that's in our community that's a young adult or just that's a human being, desires for hope and desires for community and desires to have purpose in their lives. And I believe what we have an opportunity to do is to literally celebrate that Jesus invites us into hope and community and purpose but also that he wants to extend that to the world, but through us, he wants to extend that through to into the community that we're in. And so welcome to the harbor. Uh, I'm really glad that you're here, and I believe that God is doing something special in this group, and also through, the, through us, he wants to do something special in the lives of the young adults that we uh, have a chance to encounter in our world. And so I'm grateful that you're joining us on Thursday night, and uh, God's been doing some really cool stuff. We've been having some amazing opportunities to have community, to have um, fun, to have prayer together. And so I'm just grateful that you have joined us. Um, I know many of y'all I saw at the bonfire on Saturday night. That was an incredible time. And uh, thanks for rolling out to that. Just excited for what God's doing. We're going to dive right into the message, though, because uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's kind of an intense one. So buckle up. It's going to, are you ready? We're wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount tonight, and I really believe that uh, God wants to, to challenge us tonight. I believe he wants to, to open up our eyes, and he wants us to look outward, but also he wants us to look inward. And I think it's going to be a special night, and I've been praying that God would encourage us through this message. And I don't believe that anybody who is here is here by accident, and I believe every person who's here, you are welcome, and we are grateful that you are here. But if you want to, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter seven, Matthew chapter seven, and uh, if you don't have a Bible or don't know where to turn, no worries, we will have all the scripture on the screen. Jesus once told a story about a field, and uh, in this field, as Jesus told this gardener, he planted some wheat. Everybody say wheat. Everybody say wheat. Wheat. And uh, the man went to bed after planting the wheat, and his enemy came, and he planted something else in the garden on top of the wheat. 
And uh, some of your translations, if, if you read in Matthew 13, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just telling you the story. Some of the translations say that the enemy planted weeds, but weeds is actually not a good translation. Um, the, the older translations say that the enemy planted this thing called tares, T-A-R-E-S. And tares is something that when it grows, it looks identical to wheat, but it is fake. It is not true. It's not edible. And so when the, the, the employees of this man saw that both the wheat and the tares were growing, they came to the owner of the field and they said, I thought you planted wheat in this field. There's wheat in this field and there are tares in this field. What do you want us to do? They suggested to him, what if we took out the tares right now? But the man said, listen, you can't take out the tares right now. And the reason is because right now the wheat and the tares look identical. So we have to wait until the crop fully develops. And he says, at harvest time, we're going to gather it all up. And at that time, we're going to separate the wheat from the tares. And the wheat we're going to keep and the tares we're going to get rid of. Now, this is an intense story. And the reason Jesus told this story was because he was making a point about the world but he was also making a point about the reality of any group of, 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 of people that are gathering in the name of Jesus. And what he says is that there is those who are authentic followers of Christ. But there are also those who may have the appearance or look like they are authentic followers, but they're not. And, he said, and, and what Jesus is saying is that God has made the decision that, that he's not gonna blast or get rid of those who are fake right now, but that there will come a day when those who are truly authentic and those who are faking it are both identified. Now, as I said, we're in this series on the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been learning that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus's manifesto, it's his explanation for what it looks like to live as a follower of Jesus in this world. And I encourage you, if you've missed the past seven weeks, to go back and listen for free on our podcast. I'll tell you how to do that during our next steps. But as Jesus wraps up the sermon, he wraps up with a bit of a challenge. And I have titled the teaching tonight, For Real, For Real. Everybody say, For Real, For Real. Okay, so my guy TJ, who's in the back, amazing hip-hop artist, he has an EP called Nah For Real For Real. And I told him I wouldn't embarrass him anymore, but I did tell him that I was gonna have a special surprise for him. And that was it, TJ, in case you missed it. That was it. Now, here's what TJ, I'm not cool enough to use words like for real, for real. I just want you guys to know, I don't think I'm cool enough, okay? But he tells me that, that, that for real, for real, this means that you're authentic, that you are genuine, that, that I'm actually telling it to you straight. And what Jesus is saying is, is that there are authentic followers of Jesus and there are authentic teachers of the scripture, but there are also those who aren't authentic. Now, before we dive into the text, I need to do one more thing really quick. When, when, when people in 2021 think about the word authentic, we think about something maybe different than what Jesus would maybe be thinking about if he said the word authentic. Because in our culture, the word authentic, we think of it as like, I gotta be true to myself. I gotta love myself and make sure that, that above all else, I am seeking my own happiness. This is what our culture is telling us over and over and over again. And so it can be easy for us to live in this world where when we think about authenticity, we think about, I just wanna be true to myself and I wanna get rid of everything else that is not true. But what Jesus is saying is that authenticity is more about aligning ourselves with the truth of God and that there is truth, God's truth. And, and so for us to be authentic, we're not trying to figure out what makes me happy or what kind of lines up with how I see the world, but we're asking ourselves the question, am I lining myself up with the things of God? Now, that being said, we are going to dive into our text 
And we are gonna look at two different focuses of authenticity, two different things we're gonna learn about and ask the question, are they for real, for real? The first thing Jesus is gonna focus on is authenticity within Christian leaders. And the second thing he's gonna focus on is authenticity within all Christians in general. So here we go, verse 15, Jesus says this, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So he says, beware of false prophets. Now a prophet is someone who claims that they are speaking on behalf of God. So when he's saying false prophet, he's not talking about like, an actor or a celebrity who's touting a religion worshiping aliens, okay? Like that's not a false prophet, that's just like a weird dude. What, what he's saying is someone who is claiming I am speaking on behalf of the one true God and what he's saying is realize not everybody who claims they are speaking are in fact speaking on behalf of God. And he says that they look impressive, that they are dressed up and masquerading in sheep's clothing. In other words, when uh, J Jesus says that the person who is a false prophet is not going to come to you and be like, just to let you know, my message is going to lead you towards destruction. It, it, it's gonna look a little bit better than that. It's gonna be masked better than that, but he says, Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Now, now, a pastor's job is to feed the sheep, but a false prophet is actually feeding on the sheep. I've heard it said before that you can always tell the difference between a sheep and a wolf by what they're eating. And a false prophet is someone who maybe they are actually a predator who is, is looking to attack people in the body of Christ, or maybe they are looking to profit off of them. Their message is gaining them some sort of status or gaining them some sort of popularity or some sort of wealthy possession. And Jesus says, watch out. Now here's the question. How do we recognize false teachers? It's a great question. I'm glad you ask. Jesus answers it in verse 16. And he says this, he says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Now I'm going to come back to that in a second, but I want to take a moment and I want to discuss to you the idea of false prophets. Jesus himself talked about false prophets in more than just this passage. Jesus, one time, he gathered his disciples together and he was explaining to them the signs that they should look for to know that the end of the age is coming. And he said that his disciples would know that they are living in the last days when certain things happen. Now, by the way, when the Bible says the last days, the Bible is talking about any time between Jesus' ascension when he went back to heaven and Jesus' return. So we are living in the last days, and every day we are closer. We don't know whether it's going to be one year, a hundred years, a thousand years. But we are living in the last days. And this is what Jesus said about the last days in Matthew chapter 24. He said a couple of things. First off, he said, and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will go, grow cold. But the one who endures till the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom of Jesus will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. So Jesus says, in the last days, two things are gonna happen. Number one, false prophets are going to deceive many. And number two, the gospel is gonna be preached to the ends of the earth. So deception and revival will happen. Now another mention of false prophets in the scripture is the apostle Paul, and he was writing to his protege, Timothy, and he said something really powerful and really profound. And listen, if you don't think the Bible has relevance to life in the 21st century, listen to this one. 
2 Timothy, uh, I think chapter three, chapter four, he says this, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, listen, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. How crazy is it that, that right now we live in a time where you can unsubscribe and unfollow and cancel anyone that you disagree with? And you can follow and subscribe and gather around you any number of people that will speak the things that you want to hear. And so we literally live in a time with the digital age where this verse is more popular and more possible than ever before. False teachers are prevalent. And Jesus said this. He said, you're going to recognize them by their fruits. Look with me again at Matthew 7, verse 16. He says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So even healthy trees bear good fruit, but the diseased trees bear bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So what Jesus is doing is he is inviting us to inspect the fruit of teachers and leaders to discover, is it true whether or not they are authentic? Now, how do we do this? Well, quickly, I want to share with you five thoughts that I believe we can apply into our lives when we think about the fact that there is great deception happening in our world today. And if you and I are honest, our world is incredibly full of opinions and information. And one of the great headlines and one of the great things that even the, the, the social media platforms and digital companies are trying to deal with right now is disinformation, misinformation, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false. And so how do we, you and I, as, as followers of Jesus, deal with and discern deception, discern right from wrong? Well, I'm gonna share five things with you quickly. The first thing is this. In order to respond to deception, we have to be alert. And I believe in our generation, this is in fact harder than ever. Because you and I are bombarded with messages day after day after day. And every single thing that we see on our screens, someone has an agenda behind it. Now, now a lot of the agendas are, are very good. A lot of people just want to post a picture of their kid and their agenda is they want you to like their picture and think their kid's cute. It's a great agenda. Some people want you to buy their t-shirts or you know, f follow the, their, their fitness tips and those are fine agendas. But there are many agendas that are not so healthy and that are in fact leading you astray. And so Jesus says, be alert. And I believe you and I, we are called to do this and we are called to look at the fruit of people who are trying to lead us. Now in the New Testament, fruit can have a couple of different meanings. Fruit can mean character. Jesus, or the Apostle Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so when you are listening to a spiritual leader, you should be asking the question, does their life look like Jesus? Not just what do their words say, but what does their life look like? Now we know that no spiritual leader is perfect and every spiritual leader will in fact at one point or another make mistakes and will fail. But, but the trajectory of their life should look like they are being shaped by Jesus. But fruit doesn't just look like character, it also means words. The scriptures talks about the fruit of our lips. 
And so does this person's words align with the scripture, but not just does their words align with the scripture, but when they're off the stage, do the things that come out of their mouth bring glory to God? Now, you and I, we are invited into this discernment process. This isn't just for pastors, this is for everyone in the body of Christ. There's a story in the book of Acts, and it takes place as the Apostle Paul is traveling around, building churches and preaching the gospel. And he arrives at a place called Berea. Everybody say Berea. Berea. And the Bereans, it is noted in Acts, are more noble than others because when they hear the word, they don't just say, wow, that's a good point. I like that. They say, wow, that's an interesting point. Let me look to the scripture and see if it's true. And so even the apostle Paul, they listen to him and they say, I'm going to check and make sure that the apostle Paul is lining up with scripture. And so what I'm encouraging you and what I am giving you permission and in fact asking you to do is when you hear someone preaching, don't ask, is that good? Don't ask, wow, is that a a cool point that they made or is that fire? Ask, is that godly and in the word of God? And so for me, when you're listening to me, you should be saying, is Brian actually unpacking and unfolding what is in the word of God or is he just sharing some cool opinions that he has? Because my job description is not to get up here and espouse my thoughts to you. My job description is to say, this is what the Bible says and this is how we as a community can seek to follow it. And so you and I were called to do that. When we are on Instagram and someone posts, every Christian should think this way. And y'all know there's some posts about that, right? You you shouldn't just be like, oh my gosh, I should think that way. You should be like, should every Christian think this way? Because does the word of God line up with this? Now, I need to say something really quick. No one in here is called to be the church critic, okay? No no spiritual gift called the church critic. Read the whole Bible, it's not in there. And so we don't need people being like, yo, I feel called to travel around to different churches and just kind of highlight what's wrong with them, okay? We don't need that, Not, not one of the jobs. But I think that we have to find that balance between being overly critical but being discerning. And one of my favorite scriptures that kind of helps with that balance is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I think it's verse 20, and it says, do not despise prophecies. In other words, we're not operating in criticism. We're not going to be like every time the Bible is opened or every time somebody opens their mouth, here we go again, I'm waiting for you to mess up. We're not, we're not like that. But test everything. So we're going to be discerning and we're only going to hold fast to what is good. And so I invite you into this and God is inviting you into this process of discernment. And if you hear something that I say that you're unsure of, I invite you to come and talk to me about it. There there has been a time or two at the harbor where something has been spoken from stage, maybe by me, maybe by someone else, and someone has walked up and said, Brian, I'm concerned about this. And there's been times when I've said, you are right, we are gonna address this. There's been times when I've said, okay, you may wanna consider this and and explain some scriptures and, and we all learn together. But I invite you into that process. So the first thing about deception is we have to be alert. The second thing that I want us to realize, and I have five things. I'm gonna move through the the, the rest a little quicker. The, 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 The second thing is this. Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Now, Now, there is going to be a lot of deception in the world that we don't personally speak out against, okay? Once again, I don't think anyone needs to be like the commenter that's just talking about false doctrine all the time on Instagram, okay? Like, I don't think that's helping the mission move forward, you know, if you're like false teacher, false prophet, false teacher. It's not helping. But if you know someone, if someone in your community is either believing deception or is speaking deception, 
then I do encourage you in love to approach them and say, hey, I love you enough that I believe what you are believing or what you are speaking is incorrect, and it's not my opinion, here's the scripture. Now when we do this, we hope that they turn away from that deception, but we know that sometimes people will not turn away from that deception. So what do we do if people don't turn away? Well, this leads us to the third thing that we must realize about deception, which is this, that we have to wait, trust, and pray. You see, every person has a free will. Your friend who maybe is believing deception or speaking deception, they have free will. You can't force them to do anything, and it's actually a relief to realize that. And so all we can do sometimes is to say, hey, I've presented truth. I'm trying to live truth. Now I just have to pray that God's gonna help them to see truth and respond to truth. The the, the false teacher who is preaching heresy, they have free will as well. And we trust in God's sovereign plan and in Romans 8, 28, that God will work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Even that includes that there are false teachers. And that is crazy to think about, but it's true. And the reality of the situation is that that we who are followers of Jesus, we have to understand that, that God has allowed the wheat and the tares to grow together, and we have to wait and trust and pray that God is working in the process. The fourth thing that we have to do, I believe, when it comes to deception is together we fight to build a healthy church community. We fight to build a healthy church community. And so what that means is healthy leadership. So pastors, before they are on the stage, they are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Spiritual leaders, before they are leaders, are fellow brothers and sisters. So we honor spiritual leaders but we do not idolize them. We do not look at them like they are some amazing Christian celebrities that cannot be questioned. Pastors should have accountability, perhaps even more accountability than a normal follower of Jesus. Pastors should be able to be questioned, should be able to be approached. But it doesn't just mean healthy leadership. It also means healthy a healthy environment for all of us to grow. So here's the reality. At the harbor, at our church, most everybody is welcome, but not everybody is welcome. And what I mean by that is is there's three categories of people in a church. There are sheep, there are searchers, and there are wolves. Sheep is what many of us are. I'm a sheep, Many of us are sheep. That means we are followers of Jesus. We're trying to follow our great shepherd, Jesus. Searchers are those who say, hey, I'm not a Christian, but I'm interested. Maybe I'm around because I'm interested intellectually, or maybe I'm hurting and I I need help and I'm looking. Both of those, amazing. Wolves are predators. They are there to hurt sheep and searchers, and they are not welcome. So so listen, if, if you are searching if you are, are looking, if you are hurting, if you are broken, if you are trying to follow Jesus, if you are like, listen, I'm trying to learn how to be a, a healthy follower of Jesus and sometimes I do it good and a lot of times I mess up, but every time I mess up, I get up and I wanna continue to move forward, all of those things, you're welcome here. But if you're a wolf, you're not welcome here. And part of my job and our pastor's job is to set up barriers and boundaries. A couple quick examples of that. For our kids' ministry and for our youth ministry, we have very strict policies and protocols for who can serve and what they're allowed to do as they serve. The reason is because we know that those kiddos could be targeted by someone, and we want to make sure that we do everything in our power to make sure they're safe. We don't just let anybody get up here and preach on the pulpit because we want to make sure that the church is being led doctrinally sound. So we build a healthy church community. And then the last thing that I wanna say about this, and then we'll move forward. The last thing I wanna say is this, that 
You and I, in order to discern deception, in order to fight through deception, we have to realize this, that if God did something in your life, it was real. And I say that for this reason. God exclusively uses broken people. The only perfect person that God ever used was Jesus. So apart from Jesus, if anyone else ever made a difference in your life spiritually, that person was broken, that person was sinful, that person will eventually disappoint you and let you down. Now that does not excuse sin. But, but I say that to say that, that all of us in here will, if we stick around the church for any time at all, be disappointed with someone in the church and probably be disappointed with a spiritual leader. I promise you that if you come to the harbor for more than like three weeks, I will disappoint you at some time. That's probably the only promise I can really make and that I'll try to preach about Jesus. But the reality is, sometimes the enemy can get into our hearts and, and, and honestly, sometimes the hurts are much more than, oh man, I was disappointed that you know, they didn't talk to me. Sometimes the hurts are incredibly deep and sometimes literally there is actual spiritual abuse that happens. And that's a sad, sad reality. And what the enemy wants to do is, is the enemy wants to cause you to doubt that the work that God did was real. But even if the messenger was broken and even if the messenger failed miserably, the truth still stands. And so we have to fight, and it's a challenge, but we have to fight to recognize that, that if God did something, that was real, irregardless of the vessel through which he used it. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time talking about false teachers. And so now it's time to shift gears for just a little bit, and Jesus is actually gonna shift his focus. He was looking outward and he was encouraging all of us to look outward and to say, I wanna operate with discernment towards those who are leading me spiritually. Now, Jesus says, let's turn our focus inward. We're gonna wrap up our teaching by looking at this passage, verse 21, look with me, it says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me you workers of lawlessness. Now this is a heavy passage. It's a passage that, to be honest, should put proper fear of God in our hearts. Because what Jesus is saying is that there will be those who are around the things of God, who say the right things and do the right things, but they aren't authentic Christians. And Jesus gives us two things in this passage that look good, but don't necessarily equate to being in the kingdom of God. The first thing is good words. He says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter in. So there will be those who have said a lot of good words, who have prayed prayers, who have spoken scripture, but they're not true followers of Jesus. He also says good works aren't necessarily a guarantee. There will be those who say, God, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did great works in your name. Like there will be people that maybe you and I know that are powerful indeed, but are far from God. Now, now here, here's the problem that you and I face, and this is, a, this is a challenge. Like, this is a challenging scripture because true, authentic Christians will also have good words and good deeds. So how do we know the difference? How do we tell the difference? And I believe that, that what Jesus wants for us 
is I believe he wants all of us to examine ourselves. And I believe he wants us to examine ourselves in the fear of God, understanding that this is literally an eternal matter. But I also believe that Jesus does provide and that God provides through his scripture that there can be confidence and assurance that we have salvation. I believe that that we can look at these things and trust in these things and, and that we don't have to walk around every single moment of our lives in this deep doubt, oh my gosh, I hope I'm in, I hope I'm out. But we are called to examine ourselves. And I believe that there are two questions that we can take from this text to examine ourselves. And the first question is this, have I encountered Jesus through the cross? Have I encountered Jesus through the cross? You see, what Jesus says here is, depart from me. Why does he say depart from me? Because I never knew you. So in other words, In order for us to be in the kingdom of heaven, in order for us to belong to the family of God, we need to know Jesus, but perhaps even more importantly, Jesus needs to know us. Now, now we know that, that God is omniscient. That means that he knows everything. So he knows everything about every person in humanity. So it, it's not possible to say that God doesn't know somebody. So it must mean That what Jesus is saying by I knew you means I had a personal relationship with you. In much the same way that that you know about a celebrity in a much different way than you know about your best friend. And I believe that Jesus is not talking about I know about somebody. I believe Jesus is saying I want to know you. I want us to be in a relationship, in an intimate relationship with each other. And the way that that happens is that we encounter Jesus through the cross. You see, there are people who want to encounter Jesus on their own terms. They want to encounter Jesus as a wise man among many other wise men. They want to encounter Jesus through a series of criticisms that they have about the way that he's running the world. They want to encounter Jesus as perhaps some opinions that they want to share or maybe some theological debates that they want to have. But what Jesus is saying is you, can't, you can encounter me through that, but if you want to truly know me, You must come through the cross. If any be my disciple, let them take up their cross and follow me. The apostle Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now here's the beautiful news. The way that we encounter Jesus through the cross is that we bring nothing to the table and we say, God, I need everything from you. So we come to God and we say, God, I have death and I need life. I have sin and I need forgiveness. I don't have a relationship with you and access to you and that's what I need. I don't have true purpose and true peace and that's what I need. And Jesus says, I died on the cross to pay for your sins so that you can have those things, so that I can give you life and give you forgiveness, and give you access to God the Father. And so when you and I come to Jesus through the cross, we come bringing nothing, and yet we receive everything. So the first question that I think each one of us have to ask is that. It's not, do I know about God? It's not, do I have some opinions about him? But it's, have I encountered him through the cross where I come and lay down my life and receive a new life from him. The second question that we have to ask ourselves is this, is am I building my life on God's word? So Jesus not only said, I never knew you, but he also said that, that those who say, Lord, Lord may not enter, but Only those who are doing the will of my Father. So what is the will of God? Well, first, the will of God is to believe in Jesus. We can find that in John 6. 
This is the works of my Father is to believe in he who sent me. But the second thing is that we must do the will of God, that we must seek to align our lives with the will of God. And I believe Jesus further explains that in the last few words of his sermon. You've probably heard this before, but Jesus says this. This is the context. He says in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So the band can come out and help me wrap this thing up. But here Jesus gives an illustration of two people, two houses, and two outcomes. Both people hear God's word. And both people build houses. One builds on the rock, one builds in the sand. Both people encounter storms. Now, we can interpret the storms of life in a couple ways. We could interpret the storms of life as being trials and difficulties and tribulations that we face, or we can interpret the storms of life as being the day of judgment. When, when we stand before God and are judged for our deeds on this earth. Either way, the principle remains the same, that the person who built their life on the word of God is steadfast and secure and the person who did not, all is lost. And so I think what Jesus is asking us here is he's asking us, did I, am I currently building my life on God's word? Now here's the reality. God knows that we are not perfect. God knows that we are but dust. God knows all about our weaknesses. And so this is not about stacking up our obedience to earn his approval. Because the truth is, if we could do enough good things to get to God, then the cross would have been a waste. We can't do enough things to get to God. We need to trust in Jesus Christ to be our savior. But what this is about is where are we residing? Where is our security? And if, if you think about it, like, like, like I was thinking about it like this. I, I don't know about you, but, but I, I really enjoy a good Airbnb, right? Have you guys, you guys had a good Airbnb experience before? I've had some good ones, I've had some bad ones. In uh, my first anniversary with Katie, um, we were like just truly really trying to save money and I didn't know how to roll Airbnb. And we just ended up in a really bad location that ended up just having a really good photographer in a really tough actual apartment. And uh, I went into the bathroom and it was so dirty that like I pretended like I was using the bathroom and I cleaned the bathroom. Like, cause I was like, it's our first anniversary, it's gotta be perfect. Like it was, it was gnarly. Had some good Airbnb experiences too, Katie and I, for another anniversary, I redeemed it. We were like in Rome, overlooking the Colosseum and like a balcony and a hot tub and it was like, it was awesome, okay? So I want it back, I got it back. She still loves me and, and, and she's still impressed with me after that one. But here's the thing, we, we've all had hopefully good Airbnb experiences, but, but I don't live in Rome, I don't live at that gnarly Airbnb, praise God. I live in Palm Bay. And I'm not complaining about that. I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for that. I come home to Palm Bay. I, I, I sleep in my house in Palm Bay. And so I think maybe the question that is being asked here of us and I think maybe the question that, that, that we're supposed to consider about building our house on the rock is, is, is God, is he like our home is, or is he just an Airbnb? Is he just something that we check into every once in a while, rate it, review it, maybe I like it, maybe I don't? Or is he where we go back to? Is he where we return to? Is he the, the steadfast 
and firm foundation of our lives? Am I building my life on knowing God and walking it out? Or am I, am I just checking it out every once in a while? I'll close with this. This is how the Sermon on the Mount closes. I think it's fascinating. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowd was astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching as one who had authority and not as their scribes. What's interesting is Matthew finishes this with a little bit of a cliffhanger because the crowd had just heard the teaching and they were amazed. But Jesus just finished saying, it's not about hearing the teaching, but the question is, are you going to respond and obey the teaching? And so the cliffhanger is, look, we're, we all heard it. We all thought the Sermon on the Mount was powerful and amazing. But, but, but what are we gonna do with it? I wanna invite us to pray for a moment. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you do love us and you care for us enough to communicate to us and explain to us the realities of your universe. And we recognize that in our world, there are so many pieces of information that are leading us this way and that, but I ask that you would help us to truly be in this moment focused and aligned on you. And God, what I wanna ask is, first off, that you will just speak to anyone here who has never actually had a relationship with you or has genuinely walked away from you. And I just wanna pray and ask that you would help them to come home right now. And if there is anyone here who doesn't know Jesus and who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you could have a relationship with God and so that you could be transformed and so that you could have a brand new life and a brand new start. So if that's you, I just wanna invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. Just pray and say, dear God, I love you. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I want to build a life on the foundation of you. So God, help me. Help me to make you my king and my Lord. But most importantly, God, I trust that Jesus died on the cross for my sins so that I could have forgiveness and a new life. Please help me to make Jesus the king of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I wanna give you a couple different opportunities. First off, I wanna encourage you, if you did pray that prayer, you can text yes to this number on the screen. And if you do that, somebody from our team will reach out to you over the next couple of days and give you an opportunity and just talk to you and connect with you and, and, and give you a chance to take next steps. You could also talk to myself or you could talk to anyone else here and they would be happy to talk to you about coming to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But as we close out tonight, I wanna invite everybody to stand. We're gonna sing one more song. And I wanna give you a chance here because I believe this was a heavy message. I believe it was a message that required us to search our hearts and have discernment. And so I wanna give you a chance here at the end to respond to what God said. And so down at front, we have a bunch of kind of steps and things like that. And, and listen, there's nothing holy about these steps. Sometimes we refer to them in like churchy words, like an altar. But there is something special sometimes about us taking a step forward, coming down, kneeling, and getting before God. And so I just wanna give you a chance to do that. I wanna ask you if you would, I think there's plenty of space, so if you would, be respectful. Let's not crowd up all up on anybody. Give people a little bit of space. But if you feel like God spoke to you, and if you feel like God is moving in your heart and you just need to do business with God for a couple of moments here, I wanna invite you to do that. So we're gonna sing this song. Maybe you just wanna praise God for his grace and his faithfulness. But if you feel like God spoke to you and you need to do some work, these steps and these steps are available. So Leon, lead us.
sing it. You silence the words of sin. Come on, the heavens are roaring. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life. You have no right. You have no right. You have no Hey, take a seat really quick. Just want to share a few next steps, some updates for you about what's happening in our community, and then we will be dismissed for the evening. First off, want to share two really exciting things happening next week at the harbor. The first thing is that after the harbor, we are having a post harbor ping pong tournament. Wow, it's gonna be incredible, very excited. We've actually done this a couple times and it has been very exciting. So it's gonna be next Thursday, immediately following the harbor. We're gonna be in the commons. Um, there is gonna be like free movie theater popcorn. So like we're kind of committing to that, like we're gonna make that happen, it's gonna be delicious. Um, also, just to let you know, you don't have to like do anything or like do like 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 uh, like register online or anything. You'll just sign up next week after the harbor. It'll probably take an hour or so, maybe an hour and a little bit longer. But it'll be an awesome night, an awesome tournament, and we're gonna crown the greatest ping pong champion at the harbor. And I'm gonna be honest. Really, Kevin? I don't know. I, 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 I'll just say this. I've won a ping pong tournament this year. I'm just gonna throw that out there to you, okay? I just wanna let you guys know that. In 2021, I have already won one ping pong tournament, okay? I'll explain everything later. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but here's the big deal. We, we put on these events because A, we know that in these times, like, we need community. And so I want you to just come and have an incredible time, but also we know that there are other people who need community and encouragement. And so I wanna encourage you and ask you, invite friends. Like these are perfect opportunities to be like, hey, we got a ping pong tournament going on and trick them and lie and then just bring them to church also. You know what I mean? No, I'm just kidding, don't lie. But if there are people in your life that uh, maybe aren't connected to uh, the family of Jesus or maybe are just interested, this is a great opportunity to bring them. So come next week. 
The other thing that's exciting next week is um, we are moving into a new series. We're done with the Sermon on the Mount. I know that's sad, but we are entering into a series called Response. It is going to be a three-week series on worship. What does it mean to worship? Why do Christians sing and stuff you know, at the beginning of every service? And, and what does that truly mean to live a life of worship? So I think it's gonna be really powerful. Cannot wait for that. I'm very expectant. There's gonna be some really cool stuff going on with that series. So that's happening next week. You should come, you should invite a friend. Two quick ways that you can be connected to the harbor. The first is that we do have a weekly harbor text. Um, and so uh, we send it out every week to kind of let you know what's happening at the harbor that week. We also, if there are events and stuff, we inform you through that text. Um, this week, uh, we weren't sure about the bonfire because of the rain and stuff. We were able to send it out to everybody on the text. Bonfire's on, it's happening. So if you're interested in receiving that text, you can text INFO to that number. That's our kind of official harbor number, but just text INFO or text, send me that text, whatever you want. It just sounded weird to say text, text to that number. So text info or text whatever, and uh, we'll make sure we get you signed up for that text message. The other thing that we can do or that, that I wanna encourage you is that I alluded to it earlier, but we have a Harbor Teaching Podcast. So uh, we update it every week with the message for that week. If you miss a week, if you wanna go back and revisit, it's look up this one, the Harbor Teaching Podcast. It's free on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. And one thing uh, just for you to know is that we actually just put on the teachings from the Pause Pursue Retreat. So if you loved those, you wanna go back and listen to them, do it. If you missed the Pause Pursue Retreat but wanna catch up, you can do that as well. All right, that's all we have for next steps. How we usually do it here is we exit from the back to the front. So if you're in a back row, go ahead and scoot out. We'll have everybody exit down that aisle. We will meet in the back or outside and we'll all hang out and have a great time and be best friends. Until then, we love you. God bless you. See you next week. Ping pong tournament. Worship series starts. Love you.